Welcome to Discovering Victory, a monthly podcast ministry of America's Keswick. My name is Graham Wilson, and today we have two very special guests. First off, Dr. Bill Welty, President and CEO of America's Keswick. And secondly, Dr. Woodrow Kroll, President of Woodrow Kroll Ministries and former President of Back to the Bible. Welcome to the podcast. Be good Thank to be you. with you, Graham. It is. So it's Friday today. And it's Memorial Day weekend, weekend, kick off to our summer season. And Dr. Kroll, you're going to be sharing with us this weekend and speaking to our guests. And we use Memorial Day weekend to kick off our summer. And we thought, what better way than to sit down and do a roundtable of our summer theme? Hmm. Um, this summer's theme is Tomorrowland, Facing the Future with Confidence. And as we prayed through this theme two years ago, we had no idea kind of what we'd be facing in this world right now. Well, if there's ever time for believers in our lifetime that need confidence, it's right now. Uh, just think through the tragedies that we've seen around the globe, record number of believers being martyred for their faith, uh, an unstable world scene. Uh, we won't even talk about the political arena right now. <laughs> yeah. uh, and it's certainly, you know, it just, it's a time where people are really scared, really struggling. Absolutely. In trying to navigate these uncertain times, uh, what should we doing? What should we be doing as Christians to prepare ourselves for the future? Well, obviously, the future begins today. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's not some distant thing way out there. I think we need to make sure of our future by make sure, making sure of our present. Uh, by that, I mean we don't really have a future without hope in Jesus mm -hmm. Christ. So the first thing a person has to do is make sure they have a home in heaven. Make sure they put their faith in the Lord Jesus. Make sure that they can look confidently toward the future. Without him, without the present knowledge uh, that we are a part of the family of God, the future really looks pretty bleak for everybody. Mm -hmm. Bill, building on that question, Dr. Kroll, we as American Christians have mm -hmm. faced very little persecution in our country. As we look at the current events and the landscape of what's happening around the globe, do you think that the American church will escape persecution like other Christians, or or you think we're going to face this globally? No, I think we will face it. Uh, I don't think there's any question, but that persecution for the faith is not coming to America, is already here. It's just below the surface at this point, but constantly we are seeing the society in America change for the worse with regard to the Christian. So the kinds of things that uh, we see in the news around the world are the kinds of things we're going to face here. You know, China has had a house church movement for generations now because of persecution. The good news is, <laughs> I say this tongue in cheek actually, the good news is the church always deepens and grows during a time of persecution. So while I'm not looking forward to it at all, uh, and especially because, you know, at my age, I'm not going to see a lot of it. My children will see, and I'm really concerned for what America will be like for my grandchildren. It is coming, it is already here, and it's going to explode in the next few years. So we grew up in an era where we talked a lot about the rapture of the church, mm -hmm. and, and I think we sort of bought into this position that, wow, we're going to not have to go through any of this. We're, mm -hmm. you know, we're, so what do we as American Christians do to prepare ourselves if we're going to face that kind of persecution? Because we've sort of been lulled to sleep as, yes, we have. as American Christians. We, we've always prayed for our dear brothers and sisters in other lands. Well, guess what? Um, the kinds of persecution they are facing, some Christians already are facing here. You know, there are more church burnings now. Just the other day in Omaha, near where I live, uh, a local Seventh-day Adventist church they had their altar uh, destroyed. They had uh, Bibles taken. They found a kitchen knife stabbed mm. through a Bible and left in the kitchen. Well, those are not just pranks. Th those are uh, definite uh, attacks against Christianity. And there is only one religion today that is not accepted in America, and that is evangelical, mm. Protestantism. You can be anything you want, and we're tolerant. But you tell people you love the Lord Jesus, and you have a problem in America today. Okay, so you still haven't answered my question. <laughs> oh, okay. You sort of, yeah. What, what, do, what are the kinds of things that we can do? What can I do to 
help myself yep. prepare? Yep. How do I help my family? Because you know, we, you have grandkids. I have grandkids. Sure. What What are the steps that we can take as dads, as pastors, to mm-hmm. prepare our people to face this reality as yeah. we think about the future? I think number one, we have to we have to, as you say, face the reality. This is not a pipe dream. This is not something that's five thousand miles from us. This is right here. Secondly, I think we have to steal our minds. You know, we have to prepare ourselves as if we're in battle because we are in battle. And by stealing the mind, I mean we have to get the mind of Christ. We do that by spending time in God's Word and encouraging other Christians. So it's not just like we're putting on a uniform or a battle armament. Uh, Our battle is a spiritual battle, so we have to prepare ourselves spiritually for what we will face. And that starts by getting the mind to think like Christ. And the only way we can do that is to spend more time in God's Word, absorb more of His truth, so that when these attacks come, we're not only ready to counterattack, we're also ready to defend ourselves. Absolutely. So I want to piggyback off of that. Um, One of the things I see, especially being younger and being really plugged into social media, Mm -hmm. is when you say we're in a battle, I see some believers taking that very literally. And when we see hard things happen in our country, we tend to respond. um, We could respond very ugly. Yes, indeed. So how do we have that balance when we see things like the Supreme Court decision in Mm -hmm. our country or Mm -hmm. the bathroom bill in North Carolina? These are really tough things. They are. So how do we balance that? I need to be Christ-like. I also need to defend what I believe in Mm -hmm. my faith. How do we we deal with that tension? Well, uh, Jesus is our example. Uh, He was in a battle. The Pharisees were after him all the time. Uh, Others were after him, and uh, he responded to them in a way that he wants us to respond to our battles today. That is, when he says, love your enemies, you know, those who despitefully use you, and that applies to us today. Mm-hmm. We're being, uh, we're despicable to a lot of the society today. Those who despitefully use you, we're to pray for them. Well, okay, um, but then we look and we say, well, here's, here's somebody I'm not sure I can pray for. You mm-hmm. know, they're, they're, they're doing things that are totally against my faith. Uh, you know, they've got piercings all over their bodies and they're completely covered with tattoos. How am I supposed to pray for a person like that? That person may look different from us, but it's still a person that Jesus says we want to pray for him. So I think it's important for us not to respond negatively with regard to spirituality, mm-hmm. but we can respond what they would perceive as negatively with regard to the political agenda. Mm-hmm. I, I think more Christians... First of all, let's not discount the power of prayer. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a major mistake. If, if Satan could do one thing, he could convince us that prayer doesn't work and the battle's over. Mm-hmm. Let's not discount the power of prayer. We need to pray for our country. We need to pray for those who um, you know, make the decisions that the Supreme Court and some of the local courts are making now today as well. But in addition to that, we Christians who used to uh, think that running for political office was anathema, you know, it's, it's thus them and us, and, and we're the church and they're the world. We need to infiltrate the world. Yeah. And I think more Christians who have the kind of convictions that come right out of God's word uh, need to enter the political arena and change the system from the inside. Yeah, it's interesting that uh, just yesterday I listened to some of my staff outside of my office getting all upset about the issue with the bathrooms. Mm-hmm. And I got out of my seat and I walked out and I said, so did you call the White House? (laughs) Well, no. And and I think that we have to start being more proactive Mm -hmm. by by calling and letting our voice be heard. Uh, I think we've sort of believed that it doesn't really matter what I think. But, Mm -hmm. you know, one or two people got Bible reading and prayer out of the schools. And so I think what you're saying is, like one of my concerns is I, I see a lot of Christians acting ugly on Facebook. Mm-hmm. In fact, I uh-huh. defriend many yeah. of those because yeah. they, they get so critical and attack people's character instead of attacking and addressing issues. I mm-hmm. think we have to be really careful that we don't cross that line. So where do you see the church fitting into the big picture? particularly like issues like the Supreme Court decisions. Uh, this is the moment, I think, for us to shine, not give up on despair. Mm-hmm. What, what, what mm-hmm. should the church be doing? How do we respond in these issues? Well, let's 
think about what the church is. Uh, the church is not our church, it's his church. You know, I will build my church, Jesus says. The church isn't going anywhere. The church is um, one of the three institutions that God established. So it will be here. The question is, will it be effective while it's here? Mm. And um, while we may be effective with regard to what goes on within the walls of our Sunday morning service, that is not the world. You know, we, we have this little community we meet with, we pat each other on the back, we praise the Lord, we sing and shout and do a, a lot of uh, wonderful things, but we don't impact the world that way. And I think what the church needs to do is to begin to better educate its congregation that they are also a constituency and better educate people on why we hold positions, you know, why we think that God created a man and a woman and not a crossover between the two. Uh, why do we hold positions with regard to abortion and uh, uh, many of the issues that we face today? What is the biblical basis for that? Are you convinced that the Bible says this is right and this is wrong? Are you convinced the Bible says this is black and this is white? Or are you still living in some sort of a gray area in between? Uh, the church could do a much better job in saying, thus saith the Lord, so that when people do go out into their community, they have the answers, yeah. they have the biblical answers as to why we Christians believe the way we do. Absolutely. So Dr. Kroll, uh, many of us have been blessed by your books and your messages. What are some current projects you're working on now? Well, I... Uh... <laughs> I was writing a book on crucifixion. Uh, I've been writing it for, uh, let's see, uh, 34 <laughs> years now. Uh, I've been researching it that long, and uh, I probably have purchased and read more than 200 books mm -hmm. on crucifixion. I've done research. In fact, the last time I was here, I ran up every day to Princeton's library mm -hmm. to get close to a research library because I live in Nebraska, so, you know, I won't say any more about that, but I live in Nebraska. And... Um, I have been researching that book, and a couple of years ago, I was, boy, this close to saying, tomorrow I start to write. Well, I retired from Back to the Bible after 23 years as their Bible teacher and president, and while I was with uh, that uh, international radio program, I actually traveled to 109 countries uh, teaching God's Word. And everywhere I went, I encountered pastors, They'd come up, shake my hand. They were just thrilled to meet somebody they'd heard on the radio and somebody who was their teacher. And uh, when I would talk with them, I discovered the same thing over and over and over again. These are pastors who are doing the very best they can with what they have to work with. The problem is they have nothing to work with. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of them are um, totally untrained, have never had any training at all in the Bible, Never any training at all in Christian theology, and I promised the Lord during those days that if I was ever in a position I could do something about that, I would. But you know, producing a daily radio program that 10 million people in the world are going to hear doesn't allow you a lot of time to do other things. But when I retired, I was retired four or five days when God <laughs> reminded me of that promise. <laughs> He's good at that. And uh, I said, Lord, I, I'd be delighted to take what you've given me. I have 50 years of stuff crammed in up here and 50 years of experience. And I said, Lord, how can I get what you've given me to that pastor in the bush in Africa or a pastor in China in the mountains? And uh, not very long after that, uh, I was at my very final National Religious Broadcasters Convention in Nashville, and somebody called my name. I was out on the floor where the vendors are, and someone called my name, and I went over. And he introduced himself, and he works for the Mega Voice company mm -hmm. in Israel. Mega Voice produces a little device. In fact, I have one right here. Produces this little device that is smaller than a cell phone, and it's solar powered, so you never need uh, electricity. It's perfect. And I said, well, what do you do with that device? And he said, well, we put the whole Bible on it, and we distribute it then to people mostly who are non-literate or pre-literate. They cannot read, mm. but they can listen to the Bible on mm. this device. And I said to him, do you, have, uh, <laughs> do you have any memory left over on the device after you put the whole Bible on? And he said, yes. And I, when I asked him how much, he said 240 hours. And I'm thinking, 240 hours? I don't think I had that much <laughs> Bible when I went to college, you know? 
So that got me going and ever since then I've been working about uh, 12 or 13 hours a day, about six days a week on preparing content to put on that device or this little device, a flash drive, to give to pastors in economically challenged countries hmm. what God has given me. You know, I, This is a resource and he gave it to me for a reason, I can't take it to my grave. Hmm. It's the Second Timothy 2, 2 hmm. principle. To pass on to a new generation the body of truth that God has given to me. And so that's what I'm doing now. That's fantastic. Yeah. So, yeah. no, no. So if someone wants to, to learn more about that or mm -hmm. maybe even support that, mm -hmm. how could they do that? We have a website. We call the project the Helios Projects. Uh, Helios because that solar powered mm -hmm. panel, uh, this is one of the main devices that is used in Oh, uh, distant places, or even countries uh, like the Philippines where they have a lot of brownouts and mm. Rio de Janeiro and other cities like that. Um, and we called it the Helios Project because Helios is the Greek word for sun. So it was a natural, uh, the cognate for Latin, the uh, similar word in Latin is sol, S-O-L, or solar, solar powered, you know, solar panel. Uh, and as a result of that, we call it the Helios Projects. Well, we have a uh, website that is theheliosprojects.org. Helios is H-E-L-I-O-S, Helios. Theheliosprojects.org has all the information on it. Uh, we now have, there are three projects. We have the first one completed. Uh, it is all loaded on this device. It is in English on this device. There are 200 hours, no, pardon me, 200 sessions, each session 20 to 22 minutes long, mm -hmm. of my teaching from A to Z in Christian theology. Wow. This is the theology one so far. We're, I'm now working on the second one. In fact, I've been doing some here at Keswick uh, mm -hmm. this weekend. And uh, <laughs> the second one, will, second project is storying the Bible. Uh, I have chosen 372 stories in the Bible to retell wow. and draw from those stories spiritual insights and practical truth. So it's a way to give a pastor who will never ever have the opportunity to go away to seminary or mm. college. He can't afford it, uh, it's too far away, he has a family, he may be a subsistence farmer and he can't leave home. I can now take and give him a Bible and Christian faith education right in that's his amazing. hand. That's fantastic. And, and the flash drive is just, you know, I mean, it's a whole lot smaller than this, more versatile. Anybody who has a computer, this mm. is what they want because they can plug this in. This has not only the English 200 sessions on, it has it in Spanish as well. Plus there is an abridged version in print on here. So you could download uh, the teaching, read it off your screen or print your own book if you wanted to. Wow. Uh, and the Bible is on here, Old and New Testament, just like the Bible's on here in Old and New Testament. So it's really neat devices. Talk about technology that the Apostle Paul could never have dreamed of, mm. you know? Mm. I mean, I can teach a pastor who will never be able to leave home and give him an education he would never have a hope of ever having before. Mm. That's awesome. Yeah, it's called the Helios Projects. Great. So you've you've obviously had touch points globally, and, mm -hmm. and you get to see God do things. Sometimes because of, as American Christians, we don't really see the big picture. Mm -hmm. God is doing some incredible things, and He's not necessarily doing it in the ways that we <laughs> envision. <laughs> and, and we had the touch point here in America, as Kazakh. We have a dear friend of ours that his wife has been witnessing to him for 16 years, mm -hmm. uh, Jewish man, mm -hmm. and. Uh, been witnessed to by the best mm -hmm. in evangelical Christianity. Mm -hmm. And uh, one night, about two weeks ago, he was laying in bed. He had a dream <laughs> where Jesus was actually speaking directly to him and that? inviting him to trust him as his Savior. Yeah. And when this young man shared this story with me, I said, well, how did you come to Christ? And he said, I don't want to tell you that because you're going to think I'm a little weird and it's that's, that didn't fit my yeah, little right, box. Right. <laughs> what are the kinds of things that you see? How is God working around the world and bringing people to himself? Well, I think the first thing we American Christians need to learn is not all Christians look like us. Mm. They don't think like us. In fact, the Bible, you know, we, we hassle over versions of the Bible. That's not an issue for most of the world. They only have one version, mm. if they have any at all. Mm. You know, uh, Wycliffe says that there's still 2,000 plus languages or dialects that have no Bible at all. 
So, you know, we, we, we strain at gnats and, and mm -hmm. we miss the big picture, as you say. Uh, what I see happening in the world isn't always happening in the venues or in the uh, methods that I was taught is the mm -hmm. way you disseminate the gospel. Uh, I was uh, teaching in uh, Thailand last year for a couple of weeks, spent a week with Chinese pastors mm -hmm. and a week with uh, Camp Crusade workers in uh, Bangkok. And uh, in Bangkok, they have this program going. Now remember, this is not a Christian nation. You know. They have a king, they're highly uh, Buddhist nation, and uh, they have a program going right now which crosses all the lines uh, from Campus Crusade on one side to uh, church ministries and missionaries and just about everybody. And their goal is to see 100,000 Christians come into the faith in the next 10 years. Now I have to tell you, numbers don't mean anything to us. That is almost impossible. You know, when you talk about a nation where you get one here and one there, 100,000, but here's the thing. They're so convinced God's going to do this, they're gearing up for it. Mm -hmm. Now, that's why they're interested. In fact, we're doing a Thai version of this specifically because of this program. They know that when this wave of evangelism comes, Immediately after that, they're going to need churches, and they can plant churches. But then what do they do for a pastor, you know? No pastors are trained for something like this. In the Philippines, the last couple of decades, this has been happening. God has been bringing people into the church. But all the uh, Bible colleges and seminaries in the entire country of the Philippines cannot even train 5% of the pastors they need for these churches. So to me, and this is why I'm so excited about this, the critical issue right now is trained leadership. What do you do when the church grows, but you don't have a leader to teach them? In fact, I read the other day some mission strategist said this, and let me see if I can get the quote right. He said, the church right now is growing itself to death. I thought, that's interesting. Grow yourself to death. But what he means is, that God is doing such wonderful things in relatively non-traditional places and non-traditional ways, and the church continues to grow, but it's growing itself to death because if you don't have a pastor there to teach them the Word of God, teach them the Christian faith, pretty soon the people who come into the church wander out from the church and they go two places. They either go into heresy, a cult or something, or they, they add Christianity to their existing religion, which is what we call syncretism. And, you know, Jesus becomes a part of their animistic, uh, their uh, ancestry worship religion. Mm. Neither of those are good choices. Mm. But God is doing some amazing things. We just have to watch more carefully what the needs are around the world and fill those needs. You invited us into your life as we watched your family go through a very difficult yeah. time with your grandson Thaddeus. And that's sort of been my, one of my heart connections yeah, with I you and that. Linda over the years. There are some folks that will be joining us for this month's podcast that uh, don't know a clue, don't have a clue what, what's happened. Mm -hmm. Just give us a little snapshot of what God has taken your family through and where Thaddeus is today. Thaddeus is now 13. Wow. Uh, he's a teenager, it's hard to believe. Uh, 13 years ago, my daughter uh, was carrying her third child. She had two boys, Thaddeus was the third. And she was huge. I mean, I have never seen a pregnant woman this large. Uh, I, I used to tell her that when she would walk by, she'd blot out the sun, you know, she was so big. <laughs> and one week before Thaddeus was born, I took her to the hospital and they took a needle and drew off uh, two liters of excess amniotic fluid. Now, when a woman has excess amniotic fluid in a pregnancy, it generally means a genetic problem. Um, Down syndrome has mm -hmm. excess am amniotic fluid, for example. The doctor told us what he thought the problem was, which we, you know, you go to the internet and you become an yeah. expert mm -hmm. immediately. We looked it up and we thought, well, that's not too bad, you know. Uh, but when Thaddeus was born, it was much worse than we anticipated. Uh, Thaddeus has a condition called treacher Collins syndrome and it, it is a cranial facial genetic deficiency. Neither of his parents carry this gene, it just, it's something that happened. And um, he was born without ears. 
He has no ears at all, no external ear, no middle ear, and no inner ear. Uh, he has uh, no bones in his face, so he cannot chew because his jaw is not attached to anything. And so we feed him every day, um, five times a day through a stomach tube, a little G button he has in his stomach. He has a trach, cannot breathe through his nose or his mouth. Now he can some now because he's had 36 surgeries already. One of them, a jaw distension to bring the jaw out. So he can get some air through. He cannot eat anything, cannot swallow anything. It would go into his lungs rather than to his stomach. So obviously this is a boy that's a challenge. And if uh, Treacher Collins wasn't bad enough, he's also been diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder. You know, just everything has to be right. He comes in every day. Every day he comes to visit me. He goes through the same drawers in my desk looking for who knows what, you know. <laughs> but that's the pattern. You go through each drawer. Not only is it OCD, he, he is ADHD, so he's extremely mm. active. And he's autistic. Mm. So it's like the perfect storm yes. on one little child. Uh, but he has been such a blessing to our family. He amazes us in what he knows. You know, we had a breakthrough a couple years ago because he had a special ed teacher that took a, a liking to Thaddeus. And uh, one day she said to him, she watched him as he watched her typing on her tablet. And he, she, she typed on the tablet, Thaddeus, can you read this? And he reaches down and types, yes. No one ever taught him how to read. We have no idea how he learned this. And uh, so over the course of time, we discovered that he could read, he could spell. He, you know, he just, he was well advanced. In fact, when he was in sixth grade, they gave him the standardized reading comprehension test, and he tested out at 11th grade, fourth mm, month. Wow. So, I mean, it's, he's, he's a savant in some areas. All of this was hidden from us. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the unfortunate thing is this teacher, just whom he loved and who loved him, was only there one year. Her husband is a corporate pilot and he got transferred someplace else, so she had to go. Uh, a teacher followed him who also was only there one year. So now he's on his third teacher in three years. Mm. Uh, and as you know, um, autistic children, autistic people do not like change. Mm. <laughs> and he's had more than his share. So he's doing well, he's doing great. Um, I just, it, I think life would have been a lot different and perhaps better for him had God decided to keep that first teacher here. Mm. But that obviously wasn't God's plan. And uh, so the rest of us have had to rise to the occasion and, uh, and, and be eyes and ears for him on some occasions. He still amazes us and thrills us at what he knows. I mean, he could sit in church, not pay any attention to the pastor, and afterwards you ask him questions about the sermon, he no, knows more than I do. Well, one of the neat parts of the story for me is when you shared how he trusted Christ as a savior. I think mm -hmm. our listeners would enjoy that. Well, Thaddeus, when we're in church, uh, in our home church, Thaddeus goes to a special needs class. And so he's not in the auditorium with uh, everyone else. Uh, unless he's bad in the special needs class and he gets kicked out, then he has to come to the auditorium with mom and dad and his Aunt Tina and Uncle Matt and Grandma and Grandpa. So uh, Palm Sunday, a couple of years ago, um, the number came up on the screen and our daughter went out and got him and brought him into the service. He'd been bad in his class. And he sat there and looked like he wasn't paying any attention to anything. But uh, the fact of the matter was he was listening to the pastor. So when we found out that this teacher that loved him so much and he loved her so much was leaving after one year, knowing also she was a believer, uh, my daughter invited her to come to her house, the teacher to come to her house, grandma and grandpa to come, and the plan was for me to talk about salvation to Thaddeus, see what he could understand. Well, um, I pulled a Bible over in front of him and I said, do you know what that is? He says, yes. Now when I say says, he can't talk. So everything is done by typing on a tablet. And when I said, uh, Does, do you know what that is? He said, yes, it's God's word. I'm thinking, well, that's more than a lot of people know. <laughs> you know? So uh, I said, can you, it's the Bible. Can you read the Bible? He types, yes. So I opened to John 3:16, And I said, I want you to read that verse. And then we'll talk about it. And he looked down and he looked away immediately. I thought, oh, he either didn't understand or, you know, he's not interested. 
But when we talked about it, he knew everything was in the verse. Mm. And over the years, we had been giving him books to look at pictures and read. And, you know, he'd thumb through them very quickly and sometimes tear them apart or throw them over his shoulder. And we always thought he has no interest in Mm. anything. Mm. Well, now we think he read the entire book in a matter of a few seconds. Mm. So I, I said to him, now, you read that verse. Does God love you, Thaddeus? And he types, yes, very much. Uh, So I said, um, do you ever do anything bad or wrong? He types, yes. So I said, does God love you when you do bad things? Yes, he does, he types. So I ask, why would God love you when you do bad things? And this is what this boy typed. He said, because he sent his son to die on the cross. Mm. And I'm thinking, how does he know that? You know, I mean, it's a part of our house all day long. And he used to sit on my knee, on my lap, when I was writing the content for the Helios devices. I thought, was he reading everything I wrote? And could be. We we don't know. But uh, so I I said to him, "Um, Thaddeus, um, have you trusted Jesus as your Savior? And he said, yes, I did. So I said, when, when, who told you that Jesus died on the cross for you? And he types, the pastor. I'm thinking, he's never in church. Why, how would he know that? Well, that Palm Sunday, he was in church. And I asked him, I said, when did the pastor tell you this? And he typed, at the end of the service, when he asked us to invite Jesus into our heart. And I'm thinking, okay, theologically, <laughs> that's, uh, that may not be... Right, but he understands what he means by that. And I said, okay, um, did you invite Jesus to come into your life? And he types, yes, I did. Hmm. And, um, you know, the Spirit of God is doing something in him that we can't understand. Because he can't hear. He cannot hear. He cannot speak. And you didn't teach him to... Nobody taught him how to read. We don't know how. He taught himself, apparently. Um, (laughs) We don't know how he did it. He apparently reads lips. Nobody taught him to do that. He does sign, uh, but my uh, one daughter, his his aunt, Tina, would be, um, is a professional deaf interpreter. Mm. So she has signed to him since he was a baby. So that, I I could understand that. How he can, without hearing and without being able to talk, how he can understand what he understands is just the mystery of God to us. Mm. That's just another great illustration of God can do what God chooses to do in in miraculous ways. That's really cool. That's awesome. Well, that concludes this month's Discovering Victory podcast. I want to thank you all for joining us. And if this podcast was encouraging to you, challenging to you, we want to hear from you. You can email us at info at americaskeswick.org, or you can leave a comment on our Facebook or YouTube channel. I want to thank Dr. Kroll and Dr. Welty for joining us today. And I want to ask you to keep discovering victory.